Now, local and live, it's Frederick's Forum on 930 WFMD with local newsmakers and your phone calls. It's Frederick's Forum, local talk radio for the thinking person on 930 WFMD. And welcome back to Frederick's Forum. I'm your host, Michael Kurtianik. Thank you so much for listening in. And uh, here in Frederick's Forum, I'm blessed to have Frank Mitchell, our producer, running the board here. Uh, Patty Brown uh, has to take care of her small business, and that was our big topic the first hour. Uh, So in the second hour, we're going to kind of switch gears and actually talk about a bigger business, uh, government business, and it has to do with the America's Postal Service. Uh, this is something that affects each and every one of us every single day. Uh, we put a stamp on an envelope. We send it out. It gets there. We receive stuff in the mail. Sometimes we don't want to look at what's what we receive in the mail. A lot of times we do. Um, things have certainly changed in this country when it comes to the Postal Service. And I'm very blessed to have uh, in the studio this morning Mr. Tom Dodge and uh I'll, I'll I'll let Mr. Dodge uh, introduce himself to all of you and to all of us um, as far as who he is and um, what brings him here this morning. So, Tom, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. You it's bet. quite an honor to be here. <laughs> well, I appreciate being here. I know uh, um, you know being in radio studios uh, can be a little bit uh, daunting and stuff, but don't mind um, all of the uh, cameras pointed at you. <laughs> The att- Hi, everybody. Yeah, the attack <laughs> dogs and everything. Uh, no problems. Um, so, Tom, tell us a little bit about who you are and what is it that you do as a, in, in, with your profession. Well, I'm a truck driver for a postal service down in Baltimore on Fayette Street. It's a big one. It's uh, a whole city block in size, six stories tall. All the area mail from about 100 miles around goes down there and be, is being sorted. Um, I, my current position is I work from 1130 to 8 o'clock every day, and I haul the mail out to Gwen Oak and the Windsor Mill. Mm-hmm. Um, and where do you live? I actually live in Westminster. I okay. have an hour and 15-minute commute back and forth every day. Wow. That's, that's quite a haul. But you're not alone. There are many other people, many other colleagues, such as yourself, who do that, don't they? Uh, for the most part, most of them live down around Baltimore City. Okay. All right. I uh, ride the subway every day. It helps cut down the commute. I ride down to Owens Mills and take Owens Mills down to the uh, shot tower a- exit to, off the subway and walk across the street to the post office. If it wasn't for that, I don't think I'd be working there. It's too long of a commute. <laughs> and so you work at the Fayette Street That's location. Correct. That's yeah. correct. And specifically, what do you do there? Just so I'm a truck driver. You're the truck driver. So you... Yeah, big, the tractor trailers, you know, the big trucks. Gotcha. And so um, one of the things that, um, that you do is uh, you have to get there pretty... Early in the morning? Is that correct? Well, actually, what time? the operation down there is a 24-hour-a-day service. They never lock the doors on that building. I see. It's continuous mail coming in and out of the building all 24 hours a day. Mm-hmm. Uh, the tour I work, is, it's actually you know, it's set up similar to a military. Uh, we actually have what we call tours. So you have an eight-hour shift and then another eight-hour shift, another eight-hour shift. My, my eight-hour shift and, and other workers that I uh, work with uh, generally from about 8 o'clock, I mean 11 o'clock, in the morning until 8 o'clock at night. And um, one of the th- um, things that have changed is up um, has to do with um, some problems that we're seeing in terms of some changes that have been made uh, in Maryland in terms of routing and rerouting uh, the mail throughout the state. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, actually, if you've listened to news here in the last few days, they announced that, and it's actually old news to us, they want to close down 252 out of 460 sorting facilities across the country. On November 18th, they closed the Frederick sorting facility down. Right. We've had delay of mail since that point in time. The first day after that, it was total chaos at the Baltimore plant. We had empty equipment sitting everywhere. Uh, there wasn't enough employees down there to, to take care of sorting in the mail. Um, and, and actually, they picked a very poor time to do this, right before Christmas, our busiest season of the year. Mm-hmm. You know, like most businesses, you know, that's where the money making is at. And, and uh, it was just, you know, way too much for that facility. They actually now have sorting machines that can sort the mail to keep up with all this. But that building is not big enough. It doesn't have enough dock space. There's not enough area to park all the trucks. Uh, the building inside is actually not big enough to hold all this mail. And uh, so what do you do then? I mean, if it's just you're 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 now getting log jammed here, what, 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 what? How do you guys deal with that? Well, it hasn't been easy. <laughs> <laughs> At one time, they had uh, 
well over 22 tractor trailers sitting out on the street just waiting into the building. I mean, they've had mail stacked up eight feet high. There was not an empty space in the whole building there at, right, just prior to Christmas. Um, actually, what they had to do was actually sort mail and get it back on the truck, get out, and actually, to, to, to actually unload another truck. There just simply was no space left in the whole building. And it's actually a safety hazard. Um, fire exits doors were blocked. Fire extinguishers were blocked. I mean, even if you could get out the fire exit door, you couldn't get out of the, off of the dock, down the steps, away from the building. It was just total congestion. Hmm. And uh, having gone through the busiest season of the year, the Christmas season, uh, you know, now we're here at the end of February. Have things lightened up a little bit for you and your colleagues there, or, or do you see more of the same? It's gotten better, but from what I'm hearing, I'm still hearing delay of mail. I just had a phone call from a lady in Middletown yesterday, and she wanted to talk to the plant manager down there. Well, I don't have his phone number, <laughs> but I did put her in touch with a phone number for uh, Senator Mikulski and Senator Cardin. Um, she was talking about a certified letter that arrived six days later than what it should. And it's just in this past week. And that was certified mail? That was certified mail. And you can track that online. That's how she knew how much of the letter was. And you also brought in something uh, that you shared with me before going on the air. It has to do with, uh, it looks like a uh, Christmas card that was sent. Tell us about that. Well, this is outside of my envelope from uh, a Christmas card. And Oakland Mail, this is how far away this is affecting the mail volume. This came through the Oakland pa- um, Post Office in Oakland, Maryland, Western Maryland. And it, all that mail has come down through Baltimore before it's being forwarded. Uh, this was dated December 12th. It's stamped right on there. And it was actually delivered the 2nd, I'm sorry, the 9th of February. So that's almost an entire two-month delay. That's just outrageous. And where was it sent from again? It was sent from... Uh, Actually sent from Oakland, Maryland. It was sent from Oakland, Maryland. Okay, yeah. there it is. Yep, I see. And then it went through uh, Cumberland. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, December 12th. And then it, that's, just, that's just crazy. Um, I live in Middletown. And one of the things uh, that I've noticed is that um, our mail arrives later in the day than it used to. You know, for example, whereas maybe the mail arrived... Mondays, maybe around 2 o'clock, and then as the week progressed, maybe a little sooner, 1 o'clock, 12 noon. Now, sometimes 3, 4, 5 p.m., sometimes even 6 p.m., I see the, uh, the, the drivers are still out in, in Middletown. Um, is that true across the, straight from what, uh, across the state from what you're uh, hearing also? Well, from what I've heard, and of course I'm, I'm, I'm not directly involved in this, but Baltimore Mail has been given priority. I guess because Baltimore City is so big, they would figure they would have less complaints about this. Mm. Um, the trucks being dispatched for Baltimore actually are earlier in the morning than what they're doing for Frederick. So the Frederick trucks that are actually hauling the mail out and hauling it back are dealing more with rush hour traffic than what the Baltimore trucks are. I mean, I don't understand that. That seems poor planning to me. Yeah, it sure does. It sure does. Um, one, of the, um, one of the things that um, I, I don't understand is... Um, uh, why is it that everything has to go through Baltimore? Why can't they just keep... I mean, it used to be Hagerstown, right? I mean, and also the Frederick. I mean, Frederick on November 18th. Yeah. Uh, why couldn't they save the Frederick location? Was it really just all cutbacks and, and, and saving money, or was there something else going on there? Well, according to their figures, and the end of the center has been involved in this, and they haven't been able, from as far as I can understand, any hard facts on exactly how the post office figures they're going to save money. I mean, first off, you're paying transportation costs down there. The Tilco Drive facility, where they sorted the Frederick Mail, they own the building there. They're not saving any money on a lease. Uh, I just heard recently that the Walkersville uh, post office, the carriers there, are going to be moved into that building on a temporary basis. They're still going to keep Walkersville open as they finance, which you'll still go in there and take care of your business there. But the carriers will be walking out of t- working out of the Tilco building. Uh, I don't see how they're saving any money. I mean, I'd love to hear from them and tell me how you're saving money. I just don't see it. Sure. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. We're going to take a short break here. You're listening uh, to Frederick's Forum with your host, Michael Kirtanek, and I am in the studio with uh, Tom Dodge with the American Postal Workers Union. And uh, after the break, we'll talk some more with Tom about uh, something that's affecting everybody here, uh, our mail. You're listening to WFMD 930, Frederick's Forum. This is the REM Music Hour with your host, Michael Kurtianik. Um 
Here in Frederick's Forum, we have um, Tom Dodge, who um, is with the um, American Postal Workers Union and is a truck driver, and he's bringing to light something that uh, affects every single one of us. It has to do with our mail. Uh, the, the U.S. government has um, n- have continued to make drastic reductions to our postal delivery service. And the delays that have been occurring with the mail has really upset many, many people throughout the country. And Tom and I are, are talking about uh, what that means locally and what they're doing. But before we do that, let's hear from one of our uh, callers, Frank. Um, I believe that we have Bob on the line. Is that correct? Yes. Bob, good morning. Welcome to Frederick's Forum. No, well, thank you. I haven't listened to the entire uh, broadcast, so you may have talked about this already. Uh, with the you know the costs keep going up, but yet they're cutting back and back and back. Um, I have heard that part of the reason for that is because the postal service is now required to uh, forward fund like their pension systems and uh, some same kind of things that local governments uh, are being asked to do. Uh, make sure that they set aside millions of dollars for retirees that will you know may people that may retire in another twenty thirty years or whatever. Uh, and that's the reason that the costs are up so much. It's not the actual operating costs. And are you looking for confirmation on that? I'm just asking if that would be part of the reason why rates are, sure. you know, well, they're closing a lot of places. They obviously shouldn't. And the only way you can save money in an organization is to cut people. And, you know, right. that would, but the point, point being, we cut, we're cutting people in order to pay for future retirement costs. Right. Tom, how do you respond to that? Is he accurate in his uh, statement? That's a very big part of the problem. In 2006, the post, actually the Congress passed the, two, the uh, Postal Enhancement and Accountability Act, which requires the post office to pre-fund retirement. Not, this is beyond what's normally put into our retirement and health care systems. Over $5 billion a year for the next 10 years. Uh, we're prepaying retirement for the next 75 years. People that aren't even born yet are getting money put into their retirement. Um, if you would take that away, the post office actually would have made $611 million over the last four years. We would be actually be profitable. Even though this recession is terrible and hurting all kinds of businesses, the post office actually would have made money. We've already downsized. About five or six years ago, we had about 750,000 employees. We're now down about 550,000 across the country. They've been gradually downsizing. Actually, we've been hitting more addresses and mailing uh, businesses all across the country than what we've ever done before. Mail volume has dropped, but not as near as drastically what the post office is putting out there. And we're in a recession. Most businesses have been affected by a recession. The post office is not immune to that. So as what we're seeing here since about October is we're starting to come out of recession, mail volume is actually starting to come back up. The post office projections keep saying by, you know, within 10 years, there won't be any mail left. Well, that's not quite true. In the last quarter, they projected a 7 to 8% decrease in mail volume, it's actually decreased by 3%, far less than half of what they were projecting. So as we come out of the recession, I don't know if we're going to have enough employees to do the job anymore. We're struggling right now with with the number they have. And they want to eliminate 220,000 jobs in the next three years, 40% of the workforce. That's just an impossible situation. But that basically, part of the reason is because of this, uh, the need to forward fund uh, retirements and benefits and things like that, which uh, I guess in the private sector, they more or less uh, tell the employees, you're responsible for making sure your retirement's covered and so forth. That, is that correct? That's correct. We've actually already taken cuts over the last five years in our retirement benefits and our health care. Um, right now, I just looked at my paycheck in the last month. I've paid almost as much in health insurance as I've paid for federal and state income tax combined. That's a heck of a big amount of money. I can't even afford Blue Cross and Blue Shield anymore. I had to drop that. I went to Government Health Care uh, Association Insurance because I just cannot afford Blue Cross and Blue Shield anymore. And I've been on Blue Cross and Blue Shield my whole life. I'm 57 years old, and for the last 40 years I've been on Blue Cross, and I just can't afford it anymore. I mean, I don't know how much more we can cut. Bob, does that help answer your question? Great. Thank you so much, Bob, for uh, calling in. Um, and well, one of the things, uh, Tom, is um, I want our listeners to know what else is being um, done 
in, in the state of Maryland. I want to specifically talk about um, ma- the mail processing centers that are occurring around the state. Can you give us some insight as to um, maybe some other mail processing lo- uh, operations, maybe some other locations that might be redirected and moved? Well, as you know, uh, Frederick has already been closed. They did the same public meetings and same type of uh, activity for the eastern shore, the entire eastern shore. It's called Eastern Mail Sorting Facility next to Salisbury. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was due to be closed in February because there's a moratorium until the middle of May now, May 15th, uh, enacted by the Senate, that it's on temporary hold. But as of May 15th, if the Congress and the Senate doesn't act, that facility will be closed still. Uh, Cumberland, Maryland has been one of the ones, uh, and Martinsburg, West Virginia, uh, two more that are due to be closed. Um, Cumberland, they're going to send their mail up to Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Uh, Martinsburg, even though we're already overburdened with in Baltimore, they're going to send that mail down to there. I don't see how they can possibly do this. Besides the fact that, look at the distance. I mean, what happens if there's a big snowstorm? I mean, instead of talking, you know, normally two or three day delivery, what are we talking about? Two or three weeks? Mm-hmm. Two or three months? I mean... <laughs> I know. I know. Um, and, and one of the things um, I also heard is um, that uh, we're um, looking at uh, Senators Barbara Mikulski and Ben Cardin, who are opposing this move because of the job losses of, what, 30 jobs in uh, Cumberland that will be eliminated? Is that correct? I'm not quite sure how many jobs. Those facilities are smaller than the ones in Frederick. Yeah. Frederick employed about 180 people. Right. Um, but it's still timely mail delivery. I yep. mean, to ship it clear down to Baltimore and then ship it clear back or up to Johnstown, Pennsylvania, yep. no matter how you look at it. Whatever's the accident, you know, if, if, by getting the mail, I mean, the mail processing system depends the way they've set things up to be done within a certain period of time and within a certain number of hours. If you miss that time slot, it's just like missing an airplane. You mm-hmm. missed the plane. So it won't be uh, sorted again until the next day because employees just aren't there to do the job. Sure. Okay, great. We have another caller uh, coming in. Frank, I think we have uh, Steve on the line. Steve, good morning. Welcome to Frederick's Forum. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Steve Bronze. Uh, I retired from the Frederick Processing and Distribu- Distribution Facility Two years ago, I worked there for 20 years. I also worked in Baltimore for 10 years. Uh, and I would like to bring up the issue of uh, the means by which the Postal Service has set up its own competition. That is to say, the Postal Service has fostered the development of privately owned pre-sort mail houses over the last 25 or 30 years. The problem is that if you pay 45 cents, for a first-class stamp, three-fourths of that money now goes to the pre-sort mail houses, uh, unless they are processed within the Postal Service itself. But the portion that is processed by the pre-sort mail houses has exploded over the years. Uh, the, uh, there are a number of pre-sort mail houses in this area, R.R. Donnelly, uh, Rockville Mailing Services, RMS, and so forth. Uh, but the news reports today that Pitney Bowes, the national corporation, has expanded into the pre-sort mail business and, as of last year, delivered or processed 17 billion pieces of mail themselves. So, in essence, what has happened here is that the Postal Service has set up a parallel processing system, mail processing system, throughout the country, piece by piece, or increasingly, as I say, by major corporations like uh, Pitney Bowes. Uh, And this has undermined the Postal Service's primary revenue source, which is first-class mail. In essence, what has happened is the Postal Service has converted itself to being an appendage of the private mailing services. Uh, And one last point here, uh, FedEx is not their their biggest customer. (laughs) FedEx's biggest customer is the Postal Service. The Postal Service paid FedEx $1.7 billion last year to fly its mail around the country. And, you know, this this has been the upshot of this, this whole process. The Postal Service itself has been preparing to go out of business for the last 25 or 30 years. Uh... 
And that's as much as I have to say on this. Uh, I'm happy to hear any comments you may have. Uh, Steve, yeah, please hang on the line. We're going to go to hard news break. It's the bottom of the hour, but I'm going to ask you please stay on the line because I want to address a couple things that you had mentioned. Um, you're listening to Frederick's Forum with your host, Michael Kurtianik, and we'll see you in just a couple minutes. It's Frederick's Forum on 930 WFMD. That's great. It starts with an earthquake. Birds and snakes and airplane. Lenny Bruce is not a This, this, Frank, is the song. I uh, joked with my uh, fiance Brenda, who at the time was my fiance, now my wife. I said this should be our wedding song. Yeah. It's the end of the world as we know it, right? And I feel fine. Which is, was about the Berlin Wall, right? Uh, I think it is uh, one of the things it does touch upon. Yes, uh, but uh, there's so, the the story goes that uh, um, the way REM wrote their music was uh, they 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 did the. Um, they did the music first, and then Michael Stipe, the singer, would come in with his lyrics. And the story goes that uh, this was one of the last songs for the album, uh, for Document. And then um, uh, they just couldn't, he just couldn't come up with lyrics. And one day he walked in, just spouted these lyrics, and then walked out of the studio. And this was all done in, in one take. Uh, and so that's, that's the story goes, however apocryphal that might be. Uh, you're listening to Frederick's Forum with your host, Michael Kurtianik. And uh, I hope to see many of you this Wednesday night in the Bernard Brown Center in 629 North Market Street uh, in a uh, uh, forum sponsored by the Young Democrats and the uh, Democratic Central Committee of Frederick County. Uh, it has to do with the six congressional uh, candidates, um, the Democratic candidates. Uh, we'll be there from 6 to 8 p.m., and I will be your moderator. But before that, uh, we're in the studio with Mr. Tom Dodge, who's with the American Postal Workers Union, and we've been talking a lot about uh, what's going on with uh, m- the mail and with the delays that all of us are, are feeling. And we still have uh, Steve on the line who brought up some interesting points about uh, what the um, United States Postal Service has done, uh, you know, working with FedEx as being the biggest customer of the Postal Service, Pitney Bowes, doing some outsourcing there. And I wanted to give Tom a moment to respond to some of those things. But then I want to talk to Steve a little bit more. So, Tom, you go ahead. Well, Steve's absolutely right. They've been reducing service for at least 10 years now. And uh, a good example of that is two years ago, they took out a, every stamp machine in the post office across the whole country. Um, they made it hard for you to buy a stamp and put a letter in the mail. You can still go out to a grocery store. I mean, if you go in, most of them have lobbies that are open after hours or regular post office hours. So you can go in there at 9 o'clock at night, but you can't buy a stamp. So you have to go maybe a mile, two miles down the road to a grocery store, which they sell stamps. You can buy a whole book, but I don't need even one stamp. I hear this all the time from customers. So you buy a whole book, but guess what? You can put your stamp on the envelope, but you can't mail it there. Now you've got to go two miles back to your post office and put it in the mail. I mean, why did they do this? Another example was hours cut into post offices. They used to open at 8 o'clock in the morning, close at 5 o'clock. A lot of post offices now don't open until 10 some of them are closed for an hour for lunch. They say it's because they don't have as many customers, but you go to the post office, you're waiting in line. Look at all the customers there. You have enough clerks in that post office. If things are that slow, regular businesses, they put a little bell on the counter. You know, you send your employee back to stock shelves or do something else. The customer comes to the counter, rings the little bell. You go up and wait on it. You just don't shut clear down for a whole hour. That makes no sense at all. Why did they diminish all this service? Because it's intentional. They're intentionally trying to privatize the post office. That's what this is really all about. You just had a, a recent here in the last year trying to prize part of the government in Frederick, from what I understand. Wisconsin, they tried to kill the unions there so they can privatize federal, the, the, the government in Wisconsin. Ohio just had the same thing. Unfortunately, the voters in Ohio gave bargaining rights back to the workers there. But this is a whole movement. I mean, a few years ago, they were talking about privatizing some of the roads in this country, the Pennsylvania Turnpike. What's going to happen if they do all that stuff? Who's, who's it going to cost? Who's going to pay for all this? Not as a taxpayer. Every time you use that road, it's going to cost you money. If the post office goes down right now, we're a nonprofit organization established in the Constitution of the United States in 1776. We don't make a profit. We're not supposed to lose money, but we're not supposed to make a profit. UPS and FedEx makes profit. If you mail something, it costs you almost twice as much. If you package, for instance, twice as much to mail by FedEx and UPS. You can go on online calculators and see this for yourself. 
because they're out to make a profit. I order stuff from a company called Newegg in California, computer parts. They'll ship it by UPS, clear down to Laurel in one day by air. But it'll sit there a whole week because I live in a rural area. There's no profit in coming out for one package out to me in my area. So it'll sit there for a whole week. I can't go down there and pick it up. You know, you put the profit in, in the post office, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's going to make a big difference. It's going to hit everybody's wallet because almost everybody out there is buying something off of eBay. You're buying something over the Internet. Or if you're an old guy like me, you still pick up a catalog and order something. Do you want to pay instead of $8, $16 for that package? I don't. Steve, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, again, I'm, I'm concerned here with the fact that the Postal Service has actively uh, developed a network of competitors over the past 25 or 30 years, which is in place to take over the processing of uh, the Postal Service's mail. And uh, this has all been done uh, relatively quietly uh, so that the American people are not aware. Uh, one of the key elements, as I see it, one of the most important benefits that the American public receives from government control of the Postal Service, as opposed to privatization, is this. The government guarantees that your mail will be secure. You spend 45 cents for a letter, and the government guarantees that no one is going to intercept that letter or open that letter or steal it. Uh, no one is going to engage in a so-called letter cover. Uh, once that mail is dropped off in a U.S. Postal Service collection box, the Postal Inspection Service is watching. The postal inspectors are good. They're the best. They don't care if an issue, if the issue is 45 cents. They will investigate to the hilt. They're not like other investigative agencies. Most investigative agencies are concerned with uh, major, shall we call it crime, major crime, uh, theft of over $1,000, uh, physical uh, crimes of, of whatever type, but the postal inspectors are different. They believe in the security and the sanctity of the mail, and this is a, this is basically a freebie. Nobody else guarantees that. FedEx doesn't guarantee the security of your mail. If it gets lost, you'll get your twenty-five bucks back or whatever you spent. Uh, UPS the same way. You'll get whatever you spent back, but there's not going to be any prosecution. The inspectors guarantee against mail fraud. Uh, false solicitations through the mail, uh, false billings through the mail. I had a problem with a, an investment firm, a Wall Street investment firm years ago. Uh, it amounted to them overbilling me on my account by 15 bucks or 20 bucks a month. I turned it over to the inspection service. They took care of the problem. Uh, I was, it was, I, <laughs> the, the billing, the overbilling was never represented to me properly. Uh, but 15, 20 bucks a month, what other agency, local, state, federal, what other agency would take action on a complaint that amounted to 15 or 20 dollars a month? Steve, I think those are fair statements, but let me, let me throw something in for you and for, for Tom here. Uh, there are those out there who say, listen, 45 cents is cheap. We're losing money. So why not double the price of stamps? so that we can keep the jobs. How do you respond to that? Well, there's two ways of securing your revenue, and, and that would be one way, okay? But another, another way would be to terminate the uh, pre-sort discounts. As I mentioned before, the Postal Service has essentially subsidized the development of its own competition, the R.R. R. Donnellys, the Pitney Bowes, and so forth and so on, by granting them discounts on processing of postal service mail, U.S. mail, up to 75% of the actual cost, so that the customer sees no difference. The customer pays 45 cents, but the postal service only gets 12 or 13 cents out of that 45 cents, and the pre-sort mailers get the rest. 
This is outrageous. As these pre-sort mailers grow and develop, become more and more profitable, they are taking a greater share of the mail and, as I was alluding to earlier, denying the customer the sanctity and security of the mail to the extent that the mail is processed in private facilities. Okay, But the bottom line is, if you want to enhance revenue, you're going to have to uh, cut back on these pre-sort mail discounts. Tom, what are your thoughts? Well, I agree. Uh, uh, Steve's absolutely right. Um, a lot of this work that's being done by pre-sorters could be done by postal employees. I mean, one of the things the post office says, you know, mail volume's down. Uh, we have um, some employees that are idle. I mean, supposedly Frederick didn't have enough mail to, to keep it open. So why not put that work back to postal employees and let them do all this work? And I have uh, uh, another thing to throw out there, too. Why do we need people to deliver the mail to our doorstep. There is some talk out there around the country that says we have post office branches, we have post office boxes. How about if we just have each family, each household pay for a post office box and then the postal workers will just sort mail into the post office boxes and so the burden is on the household to go to a site to pick up their mail rather than having it delivered for them. What are your thoughts? Steve, we'll start with you. Okay, well, again, I mean, that's a potential option. Uh, I don't think it's necessary. I think given the uh, current operating uh, paradigm that the Postal Service is is operating under, uh, that option will become inevitable, okay? But if the Postal Service were to continue, as it has in the past, with delivery to the door, uh, the Postal Service basically guarantees universal service for every customer, and the, and this is going to impact the rural customers, especially the people in our in our county. Uh, the Postal Service has guaranteed in the past universal mail service to the door. Uh, up until the Postmaster General decided on this course of closing processing facilities and reducing employment nationwide by as much as one third. Uh, until this point, the Postal Service had approximately 650,000 employees and 508 processing and distribution centers. They want to reduce the 650,000 employees to about 380,000 and, and close some 300 now, okay, in addition to the ones that are... In other words, 50 have already been closed, but the total closures will amount to like 300. Yeah. This denies the Postal Service the uh, uh, efficiencies of scale, the economies of scale. We have 37,000 post offices in the country. Up until the last year or so, we had 508 mail processing centers, okay? 650,000 employees. That allowed us to meet the universal service obligation to deliver to the door in most cases, okay? If the Postal Service simply maintained its revenue stream as it has in the past, which ultimately means uh, getting more of this money out of these pre-sort mail houses, if the Postal Service maintained its revenue stream as it has in the past, none of these cutbacks would be needed. No plant closures, no post office closures, and continuation of to-the-door delivery. Steve, thank you uh, so much. We're going to take a break. Thank you so much for your call. After the break, we're going to take a call from Fred. You're listening to Frederick's Forum on WFMD 930. And welcome back to Frederick's Forum. I can't thank uh, Frank Mitchell enough for all of the REM bumps. That was a song called uh, The One I Love, probably one of the most misunderstood songs in the REM catalog. Uh, that song is uh, is the only song titled that has the word love in it, as created by REM. Uh, that was an original song, not a, um, you know, uh, not a cover. And uh, it also is actually not a love song. It's actually an anti-love song. So, uh, but I'll let you guys listen to the lyrics some other time. Uh, you're listening to Frederick's Forum with your host, Michael Kurtianik. And in our final um, 
uh, segment, uh, we're going to explore uh, some more about the U.S. Postal Service and what it means locally. But we have a caller on the line. Uh, his name is Fred. Fred, welcome to Frederick's Forum. Uh, good morning, Michael. Hey, I'm enjoying the REM. Oh, that's great. Thanks for that. Okay. Uh, you all are making the case for privatizing mail service. I mean, it, it, you pointed out that Pitney Bowes is able to do the same job for uh, three quarters of the money, you know, still make a profit, and your solution is to A, double the, the price of the stamp, or B, have everybody go out and buy a post office box and then go drive to the post office to pick up their mail. And it, it, this is just government inefficiency run amok. Fred, that's exactly why we're exploring the issue. And so um, what do you think we could, the, the U.S. Postal Service should do, Fred, to stop uh, the, the money just that's being lost? Well, let's see. You, you got the government salaries that you're paying. You got the government benefits that you're paying. You know, so you keep cutting back on services. You keep raising the price of the stamp, and the service keeps going down. So that, that it just proves how much how inefficient government is. You might as well just go to the NBA to get your mail. Oh, that's a that, that's a new one. Let's think about this: the <laughs> MVA and the Postal Service. You cannot have any two better examples. <laughs> um, well, let me let me point ahead, out Tom. something to you right here. What if you didn't have like Pitney Bowes making a profit off of this? You would not have had a, a penny increase on stamps. We actually could probably be doing this for forty or thirty-five cents stamps instead of forty-five if you took the the profit that they're giving to these companies out. Why have you continually increased the price of stamps for the last thirty-five years? Because you cannot keep up with your employee benefits and your employee salary. Actually, no, no, that's not true at all. Our salaries are pretty much flat. Our benefits are flat. Uh, what is happening, and actually it's part of Congress and part of the uh, Postal Enhanced Ability Act, Accountability Act, we cannot increase the price of stamps beyond the cost of inflation. So if price of gas, food, everything else goes up, that's inflation. The price of stamps goes up. It stays actually the wait, same wait, rate wait, that wait, you're wait, paying wait, right now is back when it was paying for 25 cents or 20, 12 cents for a stamp. The actual this, price this of the stamp hasn't gone up. does not include the price of gas in, in inflation. Well, what I'm saying is overall inflation, the whole economy and the whole country, the price of, as, as inflation goes up, you know, costs go up, price of stamp goes up. The, yeah, it's it, actually it, the it, same it, rate. You're not paying any more for the stamp than what you did for 10 years ago. The administration, they are saying that inflation is basically static. It has not gone anywhere. We're, we're you know, the economy is doing so well now. You know, how about, you know, that 40 cents, um, uh, Forty dollars a month that everybody's getting for that that tax break, that Social Security tax break. Yeah, that, that's ridiculous. They're putting more than that in their tank every week now because of the price of gas. But we don't have any inflation. Well, see, the post office does have inflation because we have over two hundred thousand vehicles on the road every day, and the price of gas does inflect the cost of of you know of a stamp. So that's why it went up one penny. I mean, how many, how many other things? I mean, you're just talking about the price of gas. How much did it just go up? Did it go up a penny? No. <laughs> it went up quite a bit. What uh, else can you buy for 45 cents these days? You can't even buy a candy bar, a stick of gum. I mean, mm-hmm. what do you get for 45 cents? That's a heck of a bargain to send a letter from clear to, clear to California in a day or so. Fred, I'm going to have to um, cut you off because we have one last caller. We have about uh, two minutes left. But, Fred, thank you so much for uh, joining in the conversation. We now have uh, Joshua on the line. Joshua, welcome to Frederick's Forum. What's up, my friend? Just wanted to point out something that uh, one of your previous callers, maybe it was Steve, talking about security, and he was talking about all the pre-sorters. Yep. First off, those pre-sorters, that actually works with free market principles, just like in you have manufacturing and distribution and reselling. Resellers and distribution get cuts. They, they make profit, but they actually add to the people that are using and buying the product. So this is not taking necessarily anything away from the overall revenue. It might hit one of the lines, bottom line, top line, but it's actually still bringing people into the USPS system in using postal services. And further on top of that, keep talking about 
you know, we can bring those jobs back to the Postal Service. But they're jobs. It's not like jobs are disappearing. The jobs just aren't in the USPS. They're with those free market companies. So we're not losing jobs. If anything, there's actual um, enhanced services, and there's more for the consumer. Wouldn't you agree that that's a good thing? Tom, Tom, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, the mail industry is just like the auto industry. And it's not just the post office jobs. It's all those other jobs that are, that are part of this. Um, I think the number is something like 8 million jobs out there that are associated with the postal service. Um, another thing to think about is, uh, you know, postal workers make an average salary for, the, the, you know, for a worker in this country. They're middle class. What happens with they, they lose all these jobs or the mailers that are they're surrounded, you know, all these other industries that are built around a postal service. That's going to have a devastating effect on our whole economy. I mean, if they close these sorting facilities down like they want to do in a country, this could actually push us back into another recession. And Joshua, thank you so much. You understand I've got to uh, close now with the t- at the top of the hour. We only have about 30 seconds left. Joshua, thank you for calling. Uh, and Tom, I'm going to give you the last word in about 30 seconds. What can we do? Okay, what you can do is come out to our town hall public meetings that we're having in uh, a few weeks on March 13th. It's at the New Market Volunteer Fire Department from 7 to 9 p.m. And on March 15th, it's at the Williamsport Volunteer Fire Department from 7 to 9 p.m. Come out there. We have a petition. We're having 50,000 copies made up. Uh, find out what you can do with the politicians and the public or g- and general uh, businesses, and everybody's invited to attend. And everybody, neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night will cancel these meetings. Thank you, Tom Dodge, for uh, being here. We'll see you next week on Frederick's Forum.